I would suggest that metabolic heat can influence conflict and cooperation. To develop that idea, let's start with a couple of basic facts. First, temperature influences fitness. And second, metabolism generates a lot of heat. Thus, if cells can capture metabolic heat and raise local temperature, that increased temperature may have a strong effect on fitness. The problem is that metabolic heat tends to diffuse away from single cells very quickly. That heat is lost and has little effect on local temperature. However, groups of cells aggregated together could potentially capture and use metabolic heat. A cooperative use would capture that heat to raise local temperature and increase growth rate. A competitive use would capture that heat and use the increased temperature as a weapon against enemies in order to raise the temperature and reduce the fitness of enemies that are particularly sensitive to higher temperatures. So with that background, let's look at a couple of examples. The only example in the literature that I could find for the cooperative use of metabolic heat comes from this study of bacterial biofilms growing in the soil. In this particular study, they collected 998 isolates from the soil, brought those isolates into the lab, and grew them at 30 degrees C for two days on plates, open plates in the laboratory. They then measured the surface temperature of the colonies after two days of growth and the temperature of the surrounding medium. And they defined the difference as the difference in the surface temperature of the colony relative to the surrounding medium, which would be evidence that the colony raised its temperature relative to the surrounding environment. And they found five colonies that raised their temperatures relative to the surrounding environment. So they looked at one of those colonies that had raised its temperature, and that's on the left here. And what's plotted is the heat output, which is a measure of the heat flow out of the surface of the colony. And this is a measure of the power output of the colony in terms of metabolic heat production. And what's interesting is that this particular colony actively raised its metabolic heat production through an intermediate temperature range. This is what I call excess metabolic heat. This is excess heat produced that flows out of the surface of the colony. And this colony actually raised its temperature relative to the surrounding environment. Now remember, in this case, we're in a laboratory where heat's diffusing away fairly quickly from these open colonies. The natural habitat is in the soil and crevices in the soil, which is a much more protected and insulated environment where these colonies are likely able to increase their temperature quite significantly. Now on the right is a colony that did not raise its temperature compared to the surroundings. And we see that its heat output increased a little bit with temperature. That's to be expected because metabolic rate increases with temperature. And so the intrinsic production of metabolic heat would increase a bit with rising temperature. That's the ambient temperature. But this colony on the right did not raise its temperature relative to its surroundings. So these results demonstrate a couple of things. First of all, in terms of biophysics, it's possible for a colony to generate excess metabolic heat and raise its temperature relative to its surroundings, and that there's variation between strains in the degree to which they do this. So there seems like a lot of opportunity for further study on the processes that are going on with regard to this excess metabolic heat and its consequences. Now, this is the only study I found in the literature that discussed this particular idea of the cooperative use of metabolic heat. So we can see potential, but really very little discussion or interest in this topic so far. Now I've been emphasizing the notion of excess metabolic heat compared to intrinsic heat. And let's talk a little bit about what that means. In catabolism, the organisms normally break down food to produce ATP. And that ATP is then used to drive growth and the maintenance of cells. But a cell can also use the ATP to generate excess heat through what are called futile biochemical cycles. These are biochemical reactions that seem to have no function but generate quite a bit of heat. So the ATP could be used to generate excess metabolic heat, but the more heat that's produced, the less energy is left over for growth or maintenance. So there's intrinsically a trade-off between excess metabolic heat 
and growth. Now, catabolism always produces a certain amount of intrinsic heat because biochemical reactions tend to release heat. So there's always a certain amount of intrinsic metabolic heat that's produced through metabolism. So we can contrast the active production of excess metabolic heat with the intrinsic heat. Excess heat is a trade-off with growth. More excess heat, the less energy available for growth. Now, there's really very little information about how colonies of cells might be involved with regard to the production of excess heat and what cells are producing heat. The best examples come from aggregations in mammals and in birds, where SIB groups sometimes aggregate together and share heat. And we can say a couple of things about these aggregations, which might also apply to microbes. First of all, individuals at the periphery of a colony, if they generate excess heat, that heat's going to diffuse away very quickly and will be of little benefit to the colony. By contrast, individuals in the center of that colony that generate excess heat, that heat can be captured and shared by the colony members because the colony forms an insulating environment around the internal members. So we might expect that internal individuals are more likely to generate excess heat than our external individuals. Another aspect of such aggregations is that individuals that produce excess metabolic heat must necessarily reduce their own growth rate because they're burning energy to produce heat that is no longer available for growth. So producing excess metabolic heat is costly to the individual, but provides a benefit to all of the surrounding individuals. So this is a classic shared public good, costly production, but benefits shared by all neighbors. And that sets opportunity for conflict and cooperation between individuals in a classic public good scenario. For example, some individuals might reduce their heat production and use the heat produced by their neighbors. And such non-producers or cheaters can potentially gain an advantage relative to their neighbors, again, as in a classic public goods problem. So we can make some predictions about the cooperative use of metabolic heat. First of all, heat generation is more likely in cold habitats because raising temperature in a cold habitat is more likely to be beneficial. And insulated habitats are particularly good candidates for looking for this process because, for example, in the soil that's protected, the heat can actually be captured and used by a colony rather than diffusing away. Internal cells are more likely to generate excess metabolic heat than exter external cells in an aggregation. And that's something that could be looked at empirically. And the greater the gener genetic heterogeneity, the more likely there will be to be non-producers, individuals that do not produce heat or reduce their heating production. This is a typical kin selection argument for public goods, where the lower the genetic relatedness among individuals, the more likely it is in a public good setting that some individuals are non-producers or what are sometimes called cheaters. Let's turn now to the competitive use of metabolic heat. These are examples of growth curves, temperature in relation to the square root of growth rate in this case. These are two species of bacteria from the same genus. And these are just the growth curves of these bacteria in relation to temperature. And we can see that they're quite different. This species is very sensitive to high temperature, but grows better at low temperature. And this species grows better at high temperature. Now we could imagine if these species were in competition, that the species that is better at dealing with high temperature would gain by producing excess metabolic heat, which would kill off its competitor, which is more sensitive to temperature, this individual species. Now there's no direct evidence for such competition in this case. And in fact, in the literature, I was only able to find one study that mentioned that metabolic heat could potentially be used in a competitive way. And that was a study by Goddard. And he correctly identified the potential of yeast species to use competitive heat against other yeast species that are more sensitive to temperature. The empirical work in that study is not particularly convincing, but that's certainly the right idea. And in the literature, that's the only example I could find of the competitive use of heat. Now, another potential competitive use of heat would be to deal with enemies that are attacking. And the best example I could find in the literature actually came from these bees. Suspended on this wire here is a hornet of a species that's known to attack these bees. 
And when the bees see that hornet, they surround the hornet and form a ball and generate a lot of heat. And the hornet's more sensitive to temperature than the bees are. And so basically the bees cook that hornet and kill it. And so that's a very powerful defensive mechanism with the use of heat. Now in microbes, I have not found any suggestion or discussion of using heat in that way to protect against attackers. But I think a very likely potential application would be defense against viruses. Many viruses that attack microbes are known to be sensitive to higher temperatures. And microbes that could raise their temperature and produce essentially a fever could potentially use that fever as a protective mechanism against attacking viruses. Now, I would not be surprised if somebody in the literature had suggested that previously, but when I looked, I did not find any suggestion in the literature. And so this seems to me to be a good opportunity for empirical study in the laboratory. So predictions for the competitive use of heat. Species with a broad thermal tolerance that can tolerate high temperatures are more likely to use heat in competitive settings to outcompete neighbors that are more sensitive to higher temperature. In the same way, species that are, have a broader thermal tolerance are more likely to use heat to generate a fever to protect against attack by viruses or other attackers that are sensitive to temperature. Attack heat requires the generation of a lot of heat, which is going to require a group of cells collaborating and working together. And whenever a group of cells has to work together to produce a particular trait, this is an opportunity where we think of quorum sensing as being important. So a prediction would be that quorum sensing might be important in, for example, in the use of heat and fever to protect against attack. And finally, when microbes can surround an attacker, this is a situation which is more likely to show a benefit in using heat as a competitive weapon. So here are some predictions for the comp competitive use of heat. And in summary, then, I've given you a variety of ways in which metabolic heat may play a role in cooperative interactions among cellular aggregations or as a defensive weapon. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for empirical study here. Thank you.